and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone Podcast. If you are listening for the first time, I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of hardcore IT security, IT business leadership, innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, and fearless living principles. Welcome to the show. Welcome to today's episode, everybody. I want to introduce our guest today, Chuck Blakeman. And Chuck has built eight businesses on four different continents. He's the CEO of the Crankset Group, which helps businesses move from an industrial age to a participation age companies. And this is just a fascinating concept that we spend a tremendous amount of time talking about. And we cover areas like why managers are a bad idea, the separation of work and play, the disease of nine to five mentality, and in his new book, Why Employees Are Always a Bad Idea, we cover what this means and what this title means to people who are building businesses and leaders within companies. It's a fascinating conversation. It has a ton of information in it and all of the show notes I have links to all of the appropriate areas for you to dig in and do further research on these concepts of building a participation age company. I was shocked at the amount of profit that is being generated by participation age companies and the real and tangible experience that Chuck brings to the table in talking about these concepts. So I hope you enjoy the show. If you enjoy it, please go to iTunes and leave your comments there. They help out the show tremendously. And with no further ado, please welcome Chuck. So welcome to the podcast, Chuck. Thanks. It's great to be with you, Bill. (laughs) Well, one of the things that's been so amazing about reading your material is that as an entrepreneur myself, starting my organization back in 2001 with uh, Red Zone, I was uh, wanting to do things differently. And I've just been stumbling about basically by reading books. I think I stumbled into Ricardo Semler's, both of his books on Maverick and Seven Day Weekend, and then Let My People Go Surfing was another one, Bo Burlingham's book, E-Myth. Looking back on it, I was just like a sponge just trying to figure out what I wanted. I knew I wanted something, but it was just different than everybody else. And then reading your book was just such a, a breath of fresh air to actually see that someone was like integrating this material to help people. Um, can you share a little bit about how this got started for you and kind of what your secret origin story is? Yeah, you bet. Well, part of it is that my background is I'm a musician, uh, classical music, went to school in that to begin with and was going to play in orchestras as a clarinet player. And, uh, And I'm left-handed, and so I'm a little bit on the artsy-fartsy side. I'm right-brained. And so I just assumed, as everyone does, that the way I looked at the world was the way everybody looks at the world. I didn't know that the way I looked at the world might have been unusual. So as I built companies, I've built nine different organizations over the last 30 years. And as I did that, I I would just follow my gut and do things that seemed to make sense that would help me and the company and, and be the best for us in the long term. And, and so I built companies that were fairly flat, that gave people their brains back, that put humanity back into work. Because I had spent more time with these people than I did with my wife. I wanted to make sure we actually enjoyed each other, had a good time, and, and were highly successful. So we, we were all through those things. And I just assumed everybody saw the world that way. And as I got closer to other companies, they, I could see they did things differently. And I began to help other companies with that sort of thing. And, and I began blogging in 2008 about these kinds of things and about how to own and run a business. And, and in 2012, yeah, June of 2012, I sat up in bed one morning, grabbed my computer and uh, wrote my weekly blog. And I just took me about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and I just I titled the blog, Why Employees Are Always a Bad Idea. And I wrote down why I thought employees were a bad idea and said, here's what we need to do instead. We need to have stakeholders, and stakeholders are different from employees this way. And I wrote, it was 600 words, pretty short. Put my computer down, and the next day I watched the Google Analytics, and the thing was going viral, like nothing I'd ever written. And three months later, it went viral again. And then uh, six months later, January 2nd of 2013, I looked at my Google Analytics, and 2,000 people had hit it in Finland alone overnight. 
and had gone viral again. So I knew that there was a message here that everybody was connecting to. This seemed to be a convergence sort of thing. And again, for me, it was sort of a big duh. But for a lot of people, it was like, well, they know there's something wrong with the work world. They just can't put their finger on it. And when I was writing things like this, I was putting my finger on it for them. And so the feedback I was getting was things like, this is the most relevant thing I've read this century. I'm going to give this to everybody. I'm going to paste it on my cube. I'm going to give it to every manager. I'm going to give it to play dates from kindergarten 30 years ago. This is the most relevant thing I've read in a long time. So it helped me understand that this is a tidal wave. It's not just me. And that's what we've come to as a conclusion. As we studied it, we realized this is where the work world's going. We're going back where we came from. We're putting the humanity back in work. We're giving people their brains back. And the emerging work world looks very different than what we inherited from the industrial age. We call it the participation age. So that's sort of the secret backstory was I actually had another book completely done, website completed, cover designed, ready to go to print. And we shelved it on January 2nd. And I went away ten, for 10 days and wrote the first two thirds of this book. And then over the next three months, wrote the rest of it, researched it to make sure it was well done and, and documented and, and headed out by uh, August of that year. Very quick turn. The reason we did that is because we really believe this in 10 to 15 years, this is going to be a big duh. The whole world is moving in this direction. So that's the backstory. Well, and first of all, the book I had already share with you how this whole concept for me for the past 10 years has been huge, but the book is really clever. I mean, I love how you have the inserts pulled out because it's very dense with really like your quotes and not just your own quotes that you have personally are amazing, but then also the quotes that you're quoting from others that you found that support this different companies that you've researched. And they, like you can take the cover, you can take the inserts and fold it into different pages uh, where you're taking notes. You have that bookmark that you've put in with the industrialist versus capitalist, employees versus stakeholders. Yep. Um, I think you've given a, a language, uh, kind of a framework to this, which has been very, very interesting for uh, myself. And one of the questions that I had, though, is, is how stunning the results are from your research on a company results from like a good to great type model, which I think you'd mentioned, maybe you could share the results of companies that follow like a good to great and then the companies that follow based on your research and how profitable they are as a comparison. Right. Yeah. And I, I stole this from a guy I met at a conference in 2010, shortly after my book came out. They, I was invited to a conference in Boston to give my book away to the 100 or so, 150 attendees. And these were pretty cool. This was a high uh, level group. The uh, CEOs of 30 or 40 very well-known corporations, the deans of some of the most well-respected and well-known colleges in the U.S., uh, business colleges. And uh, this other fellow, Raj Shasodia, was there. He gave a little talk, and uh, his book was also available. And I got this from Raj's book, Firms of Endearment, clever, um, so <laughs> Sort of came out the same time as the book or the movie Terms of Endearment. But Raj studied what we call participation age companies. He doesn't call them that, but uh, I embrace what he's doing as uh, being the same thing. He basically looked for companies. He looked at the Fortune 500 and he asked one question, one really outrageous question. Are there any of you who are in business to do something bigger than make money? Which is one of the participation age principles is that companies are in business to make meaning the ones who are in business to make meaning, not just money, make more of both. And so he asked that question, Are you? In, is there anybody out there in the Fortune 500 who are in business to make meaning, to do something bigger than just make money? And he found 30. They raised their hands and said, we tell our investors, if they invest with us, they have to know first that they are not our highest priority, which is unusual for a Fortune 500 because the, your investor is always supposed to be your highest priority. And they said, well, our highest priority is to do something significant in the world around us. And, and then uh, he measured those 30 companies against the average. Well, the average S&P 500 company grows about, oh, 122% a year, something in there. Or 10 years, I'm sorry, over 10 years. So 12% a year. The good to great companies, Jim Collins' good to great companies, grow an average of about 315% every 10 years. These 30 companies that decided they were about something other than making money, grew on average 1,025% over 10 years, four times faster 
than the good to great companies and 10 times faster than the norm. And it's not like there was one outlier that skewed all that. They pretty evenly outpace, outgrow other businesses on a regular basis. So that's a good thing for a lot of people to hear because there's only two reasons to create what we would call a participation age company. One is the uh, legacy reason. And that's the early adapters. Hey, I want to do something good in the world around me. I want to leave a great company. I want to leave a great legacy. I want to do something meaningful. I don't want to just make money. Steve Jobs said, I never got up in the morning asking myself, how much money could I make? I got up saying, what cool technology could we make next that would help build a better world? And that's one reason to do this kind of stuff is the legacy. The other reason is the classic one, because you will make a lot more money. Uh, Your company will last longer. You will have lower turnover. All the metrics will drive people. And so it's important to have the metrics because the overwhelming majority of companies are still stuck, even though they don't know it, they're still stuck in the industrial age in terms of their management systems. And they're going to need solid metrics to give them the security to stop doing the dumb things they're doing. Yeah, I find it, I think that is a stunning statistic. I'll be honest with you. I have been ashamed to admit that I was reading this material through the years. I mean, I literally felt like a closet uh, entrepreneur. I mean, I had these big desires to have a company of significance that did great work with you know yeah. IT, IT security and such. But right. I also wanted to go kite surfing and I wanted to take my kids to different places and I wanted to live this. And I'm like, no, no, no. And, and I'm surrounded by these entrepreneurs like my father and others that have been madly successful. Yeah, There was no model. I mean, they just did it a different way. And- And I wanted to do it differently. I didn't want to wait till 65 years old. Interestingly enough, that was, this is my second book. My first book was specifically on that one issue. How do business owners get off the treadmill? And and should they? Should they get off the treadmill? And how do they do it? And of course, I think they should. And so that's the first book is all about that thing. And this one is really about how to continue that and develop a company around that idea where you and everybody else can get off the treadmill. But you're right, man. Everybody before us, with with few exceptions, bought into the uh, the rugged individualist, the badge of honor, the Protestant ethic. You know, a good man works hard, and it's just one of the badges of honor. If you're going to build a business, you're going to be a slave to it for six, seven days a week, and that's just just one of the joys of being business. I mean, it's just the dumbest thing. But that's where all that comes from. It's industrial age nonsense that makes us think that the only way to build a great business is to get buried in it like Marissa Meyer does at Yahoo, who I consider the worst CEO in America that I'm aware of. I would agree with that. Just I haven't dove into a lot of specifics, but just in seeing some of the material around, I would agree with that sort of reversing the whole concept of where Silicon Valley is going from a, a business operations perspective. Yeah, but she bought into the whole industrial age heroic activist nonsense that there's that in order to be successful, there has to be these these mega performers, these heroic activists, these very few people who can actually drive the company because the rest of the the people aren't smart enough and motivated enough to do it. And so she put Yahoo on her back and carries the whole thing. And she has, in the context of that, made herself absolutely irreplaceable. I think you've read the one article I I wrote on her in Inc. Magazine that she sleeps four hours a night. She pulls an all-nighter almost every seven or eight, seven to ten days. She has over 70 meetings a week. And she has two to three hours of people waiting in her ante room, very important people, directors and VPs, sitting and waiting for her to have audiences with the Pope an endless parade of people coming in for her to be able to solve and decide things. That's just horrible leadership. On the other side of that, I profiled Ricardo Semler, who nobody knows, and that's because he's such a great leader. And his company's worth over a billion dollars. He owns the thing. And uh, he celebrated his 10th anniversary of not making a decision 11 years ago. For 21 years now, the guy, even though he goes into work every day, he doesn't make decisions. He serves, he trains, he, he creates vision, but mostly he asks questions. And he has the freedom to do that. How did that work out for him? He got into a car accident. It was so bad they had to cut him out of it. And he was in intensive care for like six months. He wasn't available to do anything in his company for six to 12 months. And it grew like gangbusters while he was gone. You do that to Marissa Meyer, and that Yahoo is just going to fall apart. So one of the key pieces that's reading the book, that why employees are a bad idea, is 
it's funny what it triggers in myself because having made steps at this with my own organization, I, we've made a lot of progress. I've kind of, I've always had this vision. It's been not very elegantly executed, but it is a, a part of my vision. But I find that my belief systems have been the god awful worst thing as an owner to try to get through was these puritanical concepts. Like it is. <laughs> It yeah. is like not easy stuff to dismantle. No, it's not. It really is not. You know, and the interesting thing is I studied this and I put it in the book. I, I'm pretty sure I did. Yeah, right. you did. Yep. The, the ironic thing about the, the Protestant ethic, everybody looks to, there's like four or five tenets to the Protestant ethic. I think there's four. Could be wrong. But one of the early ones is a good man works hard or something along that nature. Well, and so everybody adopted that and said, see, that's how you, that's your badge of honor. That's how you know you, you're doing something worth doing in the world is that you're run by everything around you. You work seven days a week. That's how you know you're doing good. The ironic thing is that if you keep reading the Protestant ethic, one of the later tenets says, if a good man works hard, he or she will be in charge of their destiny. And you can't find that in any of the way that people have worked out the Protestant ethic in our world. They're not in charge of their destiny at all. They're slaves to their businesses. So they're actually not following the Protestant ethic. They're just following the first part of that. There's some really ugly industrial age reasons why the industrialists and a lot of other people alongside them had us adopt that first part and not the second part. But in essence, the, the reason for that is that you couldn't, in the factory system that has dominated us for the last 150 years, you couldn't afford for people to be in charge of their own destiny because you, all you wanted them to do was put this nut on that bolt. And a good man works hard. So we're going to have you do that part. We don't want you to figure out that if you're, if you're doing this right, you should actually get freedom. Uh, that we can't afford you to have. So that's really why we ended up with this, the first part of that nonsense and not the whole thing. Yeah, it's, uh, I learned a ton just from the history. It was almost a short history lesson on how we got to where we are. But, you know, I, I've often said in this, my own process, I'm just two generations from a dirt floor in Ireland. Yeah. And, and I, sometimes I think, gosh, you know, it's hard because it was hard two, three generations ago for my family of origin. But it really doesn't have to be now with the all the crowdsourcing and the, uh, the the way we we're connected to, to all different types of creative resources. It's uh, it it doesn't have to be this way. No, doesn't. So how do you push down? And push down is probably not even the right word. I was reading one of the quotes: "Responsibility for reviewing and setting targets falls squarely on employees." And I was reading about Gore and and Semco and such. How does a owner transform the organization so that the above the waterline, below the waterline decisions can be made within the, the team itself? Yeah, it's a great question. I think before I hit that one, I want to give just a real brief overview of, of the kind of company. Let me give it some attributes of a participation age company so that people can hear uh, the context for this. I want them to imagine a company where everybody works in teams and the teams are self-managed which means there are no managers in the company. And I can give you companies that with 10,000 plus people in them, there's not a single manager in the whole place. Nobody works for anybody except for the team. There are leaders, but even the leaders, nobody works for the leaders. Uh, no titles, no departments, no corporate ladder, no office hours. We don't tell people when to come to work, what time recess is, and all the other things you do to children. Unlimited vacation, they're all adults, get your work done and go home. Profit sharing, many of these companies that we've profiled, they don't even have written policies. They don't even have an HR department. Semco, you know, you've, you've read those books. Semco, 10,000 people, no HR department, not a single written policy because everybody's an adult. So, so your question is, how do you get everybody to that point where they can be that adult? Yeah, that I find is, um, so there's a, there's the vision of this, but then there's some, I'm sort of looking at this from the entrepreneur's point of view, yeah. from, yeah. from the, let's say the leaders do buy into this. And I'm not sure how mechanical we want to get in on this conversation, but I would love to, I think that's one of the rubber meets the roads pieces to this, one of the harder yes. parts, right? Oh, no, there's some very elegant, simple stuff here that's not easy. So <laughs> we don't have to get deep into the weeds because the, the answers aren't complex. They're simple. They're just hard. <laughs> and the reason they're hard is because of our belief systems. So the first thing you have to do 
is you have to believe that when anybody asks me this question, how do you get to where everybody in your business, all 50 of you, all six of you, or all 10,000 of you work like adults? How do you get there? How is that possible? And the first answer to that is it has to do with the belief system of the person owning or running the business. Everything falls from that person's belief system. People complicate this concept of culture, business culture. You hear all sorts of tortured stuff. There are consultants out there charging you know, a million dollars to help you with your culture. When what they if should be doing instead is working with the belief system of the few people who lead the company. Because culture, I say this all the time, you don't create culture. You simply live out what you believe. If you believe something about people, then you make decisions that way. And if you make that decision a few times, boom, you got a culture. It's the pattern of decisions that creates your culture. So the first thing is right there. And here's the practical question that someone needs to ask themselves. Douglas McGregor wrote a book in 1960, so far ahead of his time he was ignored. It was called The Human Side of Enterprise. And Douglas McGregor posited these two questions, Theory X and Theory Y. And it comes from a guy named Hudson Taylor back in 1911, who destroyed the whole concept of an employee. We can get into that in a minute. But uh, Douglas McGregor said, you have two choices as the leader of a company. Theory X. Theory X is, I believe people are not quite as smart and motivated as I am, and many of them are stupid and lazy. That's Theory X. Theory Y is, I believe almost everyone is as smart and motivated as I am, and they don't need to be managed. If you believe theory X, then theory X means you build a company like the industrial age factory system that's very hierarchical. It's a system designed by geniuses to be run by idiots because we know that people are not smart and motivated. And then you get involved in what we call lowest common denominator management, LCD management, which all management is. That's what management is. I believe these people are uh, either stupid and lazy or certainly not as smart and motivated as I am. And so I have to put in place a process to answer this question. What is the stupidest and laziest thing somebody could do in this position? And how do I ensure that that will never happen? And I create my processes, my machinery, my thinking, my infrastructures, all built around making sure that somebody doesn't make a mistake that's stupid. Well, when somebody comes into a, a company like that, and into any company, the first thing we all ask ourselves subliminally is, all right, what game do I need to play in order to survive here? When they come into the standard, 90 plus percent of businesses in America still have this factory system. When they come into one of those, they look at it and say, okay, I get the game here. I'm supposed to be stupid and lazy. I can lower myself to that. I'll be smart and motivated at home. Put this nut on that bolt. Don't ask questions. Shut up. Sit down. Don't ask questions. Don't ask why and go out quietly. That's the LCD management rule based on theory X. And gee, what a surprise. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe that of people, you'll create that world. And then those people will act that way. Everyone will raise themselves to our lowest expectation of them. Theory Y is just the opposite. I believe people are highly motivated, very smart, and should not be, should not require to be managed. And if I have to manage you, I will fire your ass. But in most cases, people don't want to be managed. In some cases, they want to be, but they'll, they'll reluctantly go ahead and be adults if they're going to lose their job for not being one. So you create an HCD leadership model. And all leadership is HCD, highest common denominator. What is the smartest and most motivated thing somebody could do here in this position? Let's create a position for that freedom, for someone to have that kind of freedom to be that good. And then we will expect people to be that good. And if they're not, we will fire their ass. <laughs> and that sounds brutal, except for this. Part of this belief system is, is having data. So let's look at the data. Before 1850, I ask this question all the time, Bill, and I won't make you answer it, but it's interesting how I get the answers. What percentage of people do you think owned their own business before 1850? And the answer is, on the low end, research shows 80%, and on the high end, 90 plus percent owned their own business their whole lives. Before 1850? Before 1850. Yeah, so yeah. What does that tell us? That tells us that for tens of thousands of years, people were not stupid and lazy. They were smart and motivated when they were required to be. They were smart and motivated. But somehow when we created machines, 
and put the factory thing together, all of a sudden people were stupid and lazy. Well, we needed them to be again because if they had a brain and uh, we allowed them to create freedom, they wouldn't put that nut on that bolt. So we wanted them to be stupid and lazy. We required that. But theory why is very powerful. And if you believe that people are smart and motivated, you'll create that structure. You'll attract those people and you'll have that company. And it's it's easily demonstrated when you look at the dichotomy between companies built on theory X and those that build on theory Y. There's a lot of theory X's out there all over the place. Theory Y companies would be a company like Semco. They have 3,000 people who work there. Their turnover is 1% to 2% a year. 30 to 60 people a year out of 3,000 leave that company. Why? Because they all get to have a brain. They grew uh, 700% in the 10-year worst recession in Brazilian history. They have incredible longevity. Decisions are made where they need to be carried out. Somehow, they found 3,000 people who have brains. Nobody there is an employee. Everybody there is a stakeholder. And then you have other companies where somehow they can't find anybody that will think. Well, guess who made that rule? It's the people who had that belief system. So it goes right back to the belief system at the top. You have a decision to make. Do you believe people are smart and motivated or do you believe they're stupid and lazy? And off we go. Well, I guess it's hitting home for me because I've been struggling this for years. And we've had like these success points where we've achieved breakthroughs in different areas of building leaders within the company. But I still keep coming back to the, our areas. I can't agree with you more about the belief system. The belief system is completely like, maybe you can help explain this because I, mean, I know some companies are like this and probably share our pieces. We've created, we had these problems. So we created these checklists and so we created these processes and we got very detailed and elegant about the steps that needed to be performed. But I think that those processes might have been created in those steps and those checklists out of the of a basis that people weren't smart enough to do it. So yep. we had to like create the checklist from the smart guy point of view so that then the less smart people can do it when that's kind of like the totally wrong mentality, yeah. isn't it? Well, but, but see, that's the classic industrial age default. It's a system designed by geniuses to be run by idiots. I don't mean that. I'd never say it, but that's what happened. And so when you come up with all these brilliant ideas on how to put this stuff together, you come up with all the checklists, all the processes, right down to the to the most minute detail. You hand that off to people and you tell them to run it. What does that communicate to them? That communicates to them that you have the brain and they have the brawn. And their job is simply to perform, to do the task. And so you've given them a task, run this system, put this nut on that bolt. Whereas in a stakeholder environment, the way you would do it is very different. You'd end up, by the way, in the very same place. You would end up with very good processes, very minute detail. The whole thing would be there. But instead of coming up with it yourself, you would say, all right, folks, we need to get this result. We need... 15 washing machines a a month coming off the line, or we need fill in the blank, here's the result I want, and you focus on communicating the result you want, and then you ask them to build the processes that will get that result. And if they don't know how to do it, then you get involved with them to help them do it. But it's never telling them what the process is. It's asking them the questions and guiding them in the process of creating their own process. And here's why. Ownership, one of the things we discovered in in putting this whole thing together, think of what I just said, 80% plus of people owned their own business before 1850. Ownership is one of the most powerful motivations in business and in life. And we need people to own stuff. And they're not going to own your process, Bill. They're going to own the one they created. So here's the mantra. In the industrial age factory system model that most companies are still in, if you give someone a task, they feel used. But in a participation age company, if you give them a responsibility, they take ownership. So the task is put this nut in that bolt, I feel used. The responsibility is make a great washing machine. I take ownership. Because in the latter case, in the former case, I don't get to have a brain. I simply am an extension of a machine. In the latter case, I get to bring the whole messy, creative human being to work. And I get to bring my brain and I get to actually make decisions, which is what human beings do best. 
Think about this, Bill. This was eye-opening to me as we tried to, to help people understand and clarify why this is so important. I ask people this all the time. What is the most human of questions? You got, you know, the reporter's questions. Who, what, where, when, how, and why? And, of course, why is the most human? It's a question an animal will never ask. That's the most human of questions. Well, what is the one question you have not been allowed to ask at work for 150 years? And the answer, of course, is why? The most human of questions you've been stripped of, and really any question, if you ask questions, if you question anybody, you're just not a very good employee. And so we know that's wrong. We know I can't imagine how many great things would have come out of the industrial age if they'd allowed people to have brains and ask questions. So that's part of this is, is helping people figure that out to get to that point where they allow people to bring their brains to work. Well, it's funny. I'm going to one thing in your books that I did not see and in the, the why employees are a bad idea. And by the way, before I get to that question, I brought the book. I, I do tons of reading and I bring the book and I put it in my office um, and I had it on my table and I'm like, oh, my God, I can't have my employees looking at the title of this book, I should turn it upside down because I, I, I would want some context, you know, for the, I love the title, but at the same time, I was like, man, I don't want the, the boss to think that, <laughs> that he's coming up with no employee idea. Cause I'm always the one bringing in the weird ideas, but, Oh, I almost forgot. I think I forgot my question, but, um, well, I think the question you were coming to is well, how can you actually say why employees are always a bad idea? How can you do that? I mean, that seems counterproductive, but maybe that wasn't your question, but I get asked that one all the time. No, I, I get them to that. The part that I didn't see in your book, now I remember my question, is related to, it was funny because I have been the um, sort of big mouthpiece and, and sort of, uh, you know, the founder with the sales ability, sort of, I, I've never needed to have sales because I just built incredible relationships and they just kind of stay with us. And then we built a great support mechanism with a team around me or to the side of me. I'm not even involved in that anymore. Right. However, <laughs> guess what? The primary skill of the entrepreneur is uh, we've not been successful building a sales and marketing team, which would, of course, be smart for employees, be smart for customers, and be smart for me, for my ultimate vision. But I don't see – I would love to hear your vision of a participation age company with – a traditional B2B selling environment in which they have to market, we have to advocate for customers, we have to install things, we have to support after the, after the fact. Like, where is that in your mantra, in your model right now? All right, let me make sure I understand the question better. So where is the model for building a participation age company or specifically a sales force? Particularly, so the, the companies you're talking about, they grow significantly. And I see right. lots of examples of, I don't see any specifically related to the sales, marketing, and promotion of right. an organization. So I'm curious, would you also, if you had to write a book about this concept with sales and marketing, would you be flipping that upside down as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and we have in our organization, in a stakeholder environment, everybody's an owner. And what that means is everybody looks, nobody thinks in terms of tasks or their own personal responsibilities. They think in terms of results and how they can be live in community with everybody else in the business. And so the, the vertical silos dissolve in a participation age company. Yes, you have people focused on certain things, but they know that the only reason they have that certain thing to do is to get the bigger thing done. And so they're really, they have their antenna up on a regular basis about how they fit into the rest of the business around them and how they can serve the rest of the business. And one of the results of that would be that in our environment, we have 10 full-time people, we have about 15 part-time people, and every single one of them think in terms of building and growing the company. Company. They are all effectively in sales. Now, three of them are really in sales, <laughs> but they also do other stuff to help build the rest of the company, the living community. They don't see themselves as this disparate sales force that has their own parking spaces and their elite this and that. You know, We just don't have that. We have this flat structure where everybody works together to build the company, and they see themselves in the very same way. We have results that we want them to get, but the way we came to those was we asked them. What result do you think you can get? And when you do that, what you find is that people will generally reach higher than you would have them reach yourself more often than not. And so they created their own sales goals. See, if I create the goals for them, they're mine, 
And now I have to chase them around and try to hold them, quote, accountable to the, to the sales goals that they might have parroted back to me, but it was because they knew that's what I wanted to hear. Instead, they came up with their own goals, just like everybody else in our organization. What can you do? How well can you do it? And how quickly can you do it? Okay, do that. And uh, again, generally people do come up with bigger, better goals than I would have come up with them for myself. Nobody tells them what to do. There is no sales manager. There never would be. Uh, They have results they need to get. And if they work to that highest common denominator that they've set for themselves, then they do great. And if they work above that, they get more, even more money. But it's all results-based. That's it's one of the differences between a, a participation age company and a industrial age company is that everybody in our company is results-based like a salesperson should be. So how does that work out? I'll give you an example of how that works out in a participation age company really well, way beyond sales. I have in my head, I can't remember the name of the company right now. They're in the Midwest. <clears throat> They're in Des Moines. It's a mail company, and they were doing direct mail back in the 90s or whatever, and one of the people on the line who was stuffing envelopes knew something about this new thing called email. She was an envelope stuffer. You know, She worked on the line. She wasn't in sales, and she went to the president of the company and said, hey, I know something about email, and we're into paper marketing, but I think we ought to get into this new thing called email marketing. He was smart enough to say, you know, I don't know anything about that. You obviously have a brain. How much money do you think it would take us to get into that? She said, I think, you know, if we buy a list for 1500 bucks, we could get started. Well, it was a $9 million company when she did that. And the last time I looked about a year ago, they were like 20 plus million and half of it was email marketing. And she's the CEO of the email marketing division. My guess is she owns, if she was in my company, she would actually be a part owner in that business. And everybody we hire, whether it's an admin or a salesperson, we give them the same thing coming in. You can create your own path here. And if you end up as the CEO of a $100 million division because you had a good idea, you're going to be the CEO and you're going to own a piece of that. That's ownership. So with that kind of lateral thinking and that kind of freedom to create and grow, we don't have any problem with people not taking the responsibility and making it go. We have just the opposite. We have to actually kick people out. We created a, uh, well, I'll get into the vacation fund later, but maybe that helps you with the sales thing a little bit, at least in principle. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's something I just, I wanted to, to pick on because um, it's uh, near and dear to, uh, I think, everybody's heart as an entrepreneur, but, but certainly my but own. <laughs> Yeah, but I think this this would be valuable for all of us as entrepreneurs. I'm going to pick on you personally so that everybody who's an entrepreneur hears the same thing. I would say that the number one reason you're having trouble putting together a good sales and marketing team is because you're really good at it. Absolutely. And you can't, and you can't get out of the way. As much as you try, it's hard for you to get out of the way and let other people do it their way, uh, with their sauce, their secret sauce, the whole thing. You just know too much. You're, you're too good at it. And I have the same problems. And every entrepreneur, when they start grumbling about, I have trouble getting this done, not always, but almost always, they're really good at the thing they're having trouble getting someone else to do. And that's because everybody else knows it. They're afraid to do it. Look how good Bill is at this or Chuck is at that. And it's it's paralyzing. So it's it's much harder to get rid of the things that we're really good at. Well, in your first book, The Big Why, and then this book, more The Fundamentals, for me, it was very interesting after doing this for 15 years and well beyond blaming other folks at this point it's right. regardless of how competent they, they may or may, might have been in, in in that particular domain called sales marketing promotion whatever it's just blame myself at this point and it's the funny thing is it's how to dig out that's the yeah because your vision your vision is sort of not when you're getting results that aren't aligned with your vision it makes you question like everything it's like god you know what why is this so difficult to pull this off but it's the last bastion it's like the i imagine if my company were founded by the technical guy that was more of the integrator the technical he would be having challenges completely different yeah. <laughs> he probably would have solved the sales and marketing exactly. thing a long time ago oh absolutely he would have <laughs> yeah so the, the the simple mantra here there's all these things are simple and none of them are easy the simple one here is that leaders managers stay in the way 
Managers are indispensable and never get out of the way. Leaders train other people and then get as far out of the way as possible. So get out of the way, get out of the way, get out of the way. I can give you just a, an hour's worth of stories of leaders, of people who were managing, who worked hard to get out of the way, and things finally blossomed, including one company that it's very dramatic. This woman owned a very small company with $200,000 a year in Washington, D.C. She moved here to Denver with her husband and was going to shut her business down. It was two or three years old and start a new one here in Denver. And I said, why would you do that? And she said, because I live in Denver. And I said, who cares? And so she decided she was going to continue to build that company. And today it's going to, this year it's probably going to do three million plus five years later. And she's starting two new companies in D.C., and she lives here in Denver, and she works three or four days a week from her home in Denver and goes out there every eight to ten weeks to make sure the thing is still there. And she said the main company was a staging company. And she said if I was still there, I'd still be driving trucks and hanging pictures. But <laughs> But because I moved to Denver, I had to figure this thing out. So we laugh about it, but uh, she did the best thing she could ever do. She got out of the way, and it's just hard to do. What about the concept of catching someone doing something right? Yeah. Yeah, I got that from a friend of mine, Alan Weingarten, because we're always in the industrial age company. It's just we're, we're always catching people doing stuff wrong. It's easy to, to yell at people for doing stuff wrong. But why don't we instead catch them? Let's, let's do uh, LCD or HCD, highest common denominator. Let's catch them doing things right and reinforce that. Instead of scaring them away from doing things wrong, let's incentivize them to go do things right. So all of our incentive models are built on that. When people do things above and beyond, we, we never give raises. People will make more money because they took more responsibility. So we'll catch somebody taking something on and we'll give them a raise because you did that. Or we'll give them a spiff or we'll give them this one woman decided she could learn how to lay out my second book. Well, it cost me four or $5,000 to farm that out. She learned, she, we bought her the software for a few hundred bucks. She learned it. She got really good at it. She laid out my second book. She didn't even ask. We gave her $1,500 as a, you know, and I saved money and she made money. And, and so all of that is part of that same idea of catching people doing something right. All the research on this stuff shows that uh, when you encourage people by telling them how well they're doing, it just is so motivating. Uh, I could tell you tragic stories from my own childhood where I was told for decades that I was stupid. And again, we, we raise ourselves to people's lowest expectations of us. So I, I had this ringing in my ears as a kid. How dumb can you be? I just heard that all the time. You must be the dumbest kid on earth. How dumb can you be? Turns out I could be pretty dumb. I graduated like 25 from the bottom in a class of 525 people. They, they were discussing me on the day of graduation to see if they'd even let me graduate. So it turns out you can be pretty dumb. But if you encourage people, it's amazing. You know, they will raise themselves to your highest expectation of them. So catch, make that a habit. Catch people doing stuff right. Well, your analogy in the book uh, regarding a, a soccer team hit home for me because I'm a soccer coach for my kids, a uh, travel soccer coach. So it's pretty competitive. They're not doing recreation level soccer. And what's really interesting is the analogy you made is that when the ball is at your feet and you pass to someone else, the ball is at their feet. They're responsible mm -hmm. uh, for executing on their position and uh, on the next steps with that ball. No one can help them out. I mean, they can help them out by moving into space or moving into position right. to receive it. But yep. It's really interesting analogy that really hit home for me. Yeah, it's a great analogy. It works for basketball, soccer, hockey, and a couple other team games where there's a ball or a puck that gets passed around a lot. And, and I love it. Yeah, soccer is one of my favorite games. It is my favorite game. And, and if you think about this, how dumb would it be if the manager would run out onto the field, grab the ball from, from the first guy, kick it to the second guy, run over there, grab the ball from him, kick it to the third guy. But that's exactly what's happening in every industrial age business. We're not allowed to kick the ball. The manager is on the field, you know, telling us exactly what to do or doing it for us. And in the, in the participation age company, the manager is on the sidelines. And then we review the tape afterwards. He trains, he guides, he gives you all the information and all the uh, tools you need. And then guess what? He gets out of the way. And he trusts that you will do HCD leadership. He assumes you're going to do the best. And if you don't, he will try and retrain you, 
And if he can't retrain you, he will get somebody else. But it would be interesting to put together a soccer team based on industrial age traditional management practices. You'd have 11 people on the field, and you'd probably have three or four managers running around the field kicking the ball and telling people what to do as well. It would you know, just be absurd, but that's what we do at work. We think that makes sense. Well, I think it's the HCD, which that stands for highest common denominator, right? Yep. So yep. it's it's funny when you're coaching and the, the team, it's funny how the brain actually, when it's in that environment, operates differently with the kids because like literally we are, we're training the kids to operate from a, the, we'll continue to train and coach according to the highest common denominator, not the skill level they're currently at, That's right. but That's like, right. here's what we expect from this position and keep working and keep working and be patient and keep working. And until they can actually do that. Uh, but in the business side, it's really interesting. All of a sudden this different brain jumps in. Yeah. Um, uh, the the best there's a great the the movie about the 1980 hockey team that that beat the Russians in Lake Placid. Great movie about this whole concept of HCD leadership. The coach just believed that these people, these bunch of scruffy college kids, could beat the best pro team on earth in history, and he just believed they could, and he got them to believe the same thing, and they somehow raised themselves to his highest expectation of them. And I'm, you know, I, I don't have another movie in my mind right now, but I'm sure there's movies that show you just the opposite of people being told they could never do anything and they figured out they couldn't. Well, great story about that. So the guy who scored the winning goal, um, ah, she's from Boston area where I was. Mike Ruzioni was it? Yes, Ruzioni. So I heard him speak a couple of years ago and Ruzioni was, um, I guess she lives up in the New England, Boston area. And he goes, you know, it just makes me so sad. I go to the, the recreation youth hockey games and I hear the parents screaming at the kids, screaming at the kids in the middle of their swing, in the middle of their making a move on the ice. And he's like, listen, when your kid is in the middle of a move, in the middle of doing something, don't be screaming at him. Let him execute on the move. Then go back and educate and inform later, but don't get in their brain in the middle of a move. And it was really, it hit me. I mean, it was like, this is a seven years ago. I heard him. But uh, this is, that's a great example of the difference between a participation age leader and an industrial age manager. Managers keep people from making mistakes. That's how they add value. I'm more smart and motivated than you are. And so I know what to do. I will tell you what to do. You will do this task and you will not have a brain. Uh, leaders do the exact opposite. They encourage people to not make mistakes, but to investigate, to create, to explore. And in the context of doing that, they know it will be messy. But if that person makes what, what appears to be a mistake, it's not really a mistake. They've just learned from it and they'll never do it again. And you as a leader are one inch closer to being free because you allowed them to learn this and they'll, they've got it now. And now you'll never have to teach them that again. Managers just create a treadmill for themselves. Leaders train other people and get out of the way. Well, Chuck, I do appreciate you for your time with me today and for the impact you're making on the world with these books. Um, The why employees are always a bad idea. This hit me like a a two by four across my head. And it's what a resource for folks like myself, entrepreneurs that that are trying to figure out uh, the best way to to build a business. This is the best way to build a business by far. And yep. uh, I, I really appreciate you for your contribution to, to helping small businesses, uh, managers, in, or limiting land managers, but leaders in the world. Very cool. Well, the, uh, it's great to connect with people who get this and are moving in this direction. And, and I think uh, that you should be encouraged. There are uh, a few dozen giant corporations, hundreds of mid-sized ones and thousands of smaller ones that are moving as fast as they can in this direction. We are finally in the last throes of the industrial age. We're, we're getting out from under. It'll take another 10 or 15 years, but you're going the right direction. Keep going. So last question for you. What is your definition of a no limit life? Oh, good question. My definition off the top of my head would be a life where I can ask myself, what is it that I want to do? What is it that I can do? And I have the freedom to create. I, I say freedom is the ability to choose what to do with my time and my money and my creative juices. So the no limits life for me would be simply to say, here's what I want to do. And I have the freedom to aspire to it. And I may never get there. 
But it's the joy isn't in the destination, the joy is in the journey. So if you have the freedom to pursue whatever dream, whatever vision you have, to me, that's a no limits life. Uh, create a story. I put that in my blog last week. Live stretched out. Don't live stressed out. Live stretched out and have a story. And that to me would be a, a no limits life. Live stretched out. I love that. Well, I'm going to put the show notes, links to your blog, links to uh, your business uh, for people to reach out to you and your team. If they want to start to engage with your organization uh, regarding these concepts, uh, your books. So all of that will be on our uh, blog. And, uh, and I appreciate very much for your time, Chuck. Well, I appreciate you very much for listening to the Red Zone podcast. Chuck and I had a lot of fun. I really enjoyed listening to the philosophies of people like Chuck who are applying new concepts and ideas in a business environment. It takes a lot of courage to do that. And surrounding yourself with mentors, even if those happen to come from podcasts and books, is incredibly important. And it has been for me in my development through the years. So if you found this material helpful and useful, please go to iTunes, click on the links on the show notes, and you it'll route you right to iTunes and leave your comments about the show and what you think of it. So until the next program, thank you very much and have a great day. So there you have it. This wraps another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. To get all the relevant show notes, please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcasts. Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, I appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.